<sighs> I'm, I feel a little free lately. I've been uh, writing less scripts and uh, just kind of making a few notes about things I want to talk about. Last week, we talked a little about the beginning of forgiveness and the story and the, the act of Ho'oponopono. We talked about the elements of prayer, the elements of there being a problem or a transgression to look at, and we looked at there being silence taken to recognize the entanglement of emotions. You know, and, and today, hearing the reading and hearing these songs about what's in one's heart, it just uh, reminded me of a story I know some of you have heard. My parents are, I think, on this, so some of you have lived. Um, but for those of you who don't know it, it's hard for me not to share the time when I was having a procedure, relatively routine procedure on my heart in my 30s, early 30s, and uh, something went wrong during the proceeding, and I needed to be uh, put under and, so that I could be shocked back into a normal rhythm. It's not a totally, looking back, not a totally weird or strange occurrence, but when you're the one with eight people around you in a telemetry table and um, an anesthesiologist uh, trying to ask you really specific questions, and literally they have the ER paddles out and they're you know, getting them ready to go, like waiting for you. Uh, you kind of start to wonder what you've done with your gosh darn life up until that point, you know? Uh, but I do remember that period as they were getting ready to put the paddles on me. Um, I remember thinking, the last thought really that went through my mind was gratitude for forgiving the people that had harmed me the most in my life. I went through, um, you know, life like anybody else, being hurt, you know, having questions, having hard feelings about things. And uh, in that moment, the last thing that passed through my head, other than the lyrics of 17 Again by Annie Lennox, were uh, the thought, man, I'm glad I did that because I don't know if I'm coming back. Um, I did come back and then completely forgot about any of that, you know, uh, stuff. No, I'm kidding. Uh, as I'm telling you the story today, it's still important to me uh, what's there in the heart. Not everyone needs five electrodes in their heart to wonder what's in their heart. I actually know exactly what's in my heart because I have the photos to prove it. But, um, you know, many of us have more feelings in our hearts than that. And when we're looking at Ho'oponopono and thinking about this next phase of what is on our minds, what's on our hearts, what are we feeling, the next three parts of this process are that families are expected to cooperate in the process and to hold and not to hold fast to the problem, not to stay focused on the problem. And then there's confession, repentance, and forgiveness, all phenomenal church words we'll get to. And then everyone releases each other. So this is the next three parts of Ho'oponopono, which originally came from an idea of breaking kapu, the sacred uh, relationship between humans and uh, the divine and the gods. And though today it usually refers more to, to breaking someone's heart, it, it refers more to that and uh, what could be more sacred, really. Which brings us to this question that uh, is raised really by Howard Thurman, this uh, adventure that we are on um, of ourselves, the inward journey. The name of the book is uh, for the inward journey. Every time I open this book, uh, I see I see the name uh, Judy Wells. Um, Reverend Judy Wells was actually the person who approved me for, she was the head of the committee that approved me for ministry when I was a baby, baby, baby minister. Uh, she died last year, and she gifted me so many of her books. I'm actually reading, so when I open her books, I you know, remember her because uh, her name is in all of them because that's the kind of person she was and that's the kind of person we love. Her husband, Dwayne, uh, is a, also a UU minister in Portland, Oregon. So I, whenever I pick up one of her books, I just like to honor her and this is one of hers. And it's fun because there's marginalia in her books that I also got to inherit um, that makes me very happy to read. And this is something from the introduction of For the Inward Journey from Howard Thurman. 
He writes, as a boy in Florida, I walked along the beach of the Atlantic in the quiet stillness. I held my breath against the night and watched the stars etch their brightness on the face of the darkened canopy of the heavens. I had the sense that all things, the sand, the sea, the night, and I, were one lung through which all of life breathed. The writers in here and anyone will understand, no one sees lung coming. The, the genius of Howard Thurman is in every sentence, every everything. Who, who think, oh yeah, it's going to talk about a lung, but he does, and now it's in our minds. He's, ah, the genius is not of this world um, for Howard Thurman. And it shows in his life, which was an adventure. This is a gentleman who um, was raised very strict religious uh, in the church from around 1900 by his grandmother in the black church tradition, became a Baptist minister after attending Morehouse College with uh, um, Martin Luther King Sr., Martin Luther King Jr.'s father. They were classmates there at Morehouse, then went to Crozer Theological Seminary in Rochester, New York, graduated, became a Baptist minister, and then had some, some really interesting opportunities. He went from there back to Morehouse to be what they call Dean of Chapel. If anyone has ever wanted a job in the world, um, Dean of Chapel should be one that you want. You get to work at a university, say whatever you want, you get the freedom of the pulpit, you get to mold and help the spiritual minds of young people and do all kinds of interesting work in worship. I guess it's, I should say if you're a worship nerd like me, that's the job you want. I would never really want that job. But that's what he was at Morehouse College. So he was exposed to so many new ways of thinking, so many ways of being all at the same time continuing this journey of his own spirit that he was on. And one of the things he got to do from that was go to Asia. And in Asia, he had a very interesting experience over and over he was asked, he explains, he was asked by Hindus, Buddhists, and Muslims all over India and other parts of Asia where he traveled, he was asked to explain his connections to the Christianity of the slaveholders, lynch mobs, and other white supremacists in the USA that set him on his pathways that he never abandoned. What he started to say was this, these are his words, he started to change this journey, to see his experience of both himself and his family, and started to, to say these words. He made a careful distinction between Christianity and the religion of Jesus. He identified himself primarily with the latter, with this religion of Jesus. And we're not going to get, you know, too far down that road, but in the beautiful music that Leslie and Dennis shared with us today, and in other ways rooted we are as a faith in the Christian tradition of universalism and Unitarianism, both of which tarried very, very far from Orthodox, quote, Christianity, and both became truly more about a religion based on the life of Jesus even in the mid-1800s and into the 1900s and today, both have, since 1961, uh, officially broken, in a sense, that chain. There are still many Christians among us, but this was done in order to allow a wider, more accepting, more bountiful expression of faith in our tradition. And so part of what Thurman is explaining is this lifelong journey of faith, that he had to go to another country before he understood his own faith, really, when he had to explain it to others. How better do we understand our own faith until we have to explain it to others? And that brings up, how better do I understand the hard feelings I'm having about someone until I have to explain it to others? How much easier is it for me to just not talk about something and just kind of, I'm going to do my own thing, and just that whole thing I'm just not going to talk about. 
That's something you can do with faith. It's something you can do with life. It's something you can do with a lot of things. But part of the reading that Richard so beautifully illuminated is the sense that when we do that, when we are not reconciled with anybody in our orbit, we are cutting off the wholeness of love. The picture we want to paint is missing a shade, a color. The music we want to sing together is missing a whole part of the harmony. When we cut off things, even unconsciously, maybe our bodies are having a trauma response. Maybe our minds are doing whatever strategies we, we learn to get by. And for a while, that's fine. And that is the message here, friends. Look at Thurman's life. For a while, it was fine to be one at one of the best seminaries in the country. It was fine to be at Morehouse College. And then it was fine to change and to grow because what he did after that was went to Boston University. And who was doing his doctoral work at Boston University, but the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. So this man, Howard Thurman, who was a classmate of King's father, now had this opportunity to share his learning and his understanding with the leader who would shape the face of justice work for centuries for the world. He wanted, he wanted King to take his job. He tried to get him. He said, you should just take over my job. You would be the best uh, dean of chapel, the best you know, chaplain, whatever anyone could have, but Dr. King knew he needed to go south. So he is then on his own journey, knowing where he needed that to be fulfilled. See, like Thurman, like all of us, we are on a journey. Now, yes, it's an inward journey, but we've also discovered it is a journey toward the heart of others. For the heart needs to be a swinging door, as the end of the reading says. It goes in and it goes out. The heart is a swinging door. Man, Thurman is good, because what does it do? It pumps blood in and out, in and out. The metaphors are rich. And so this kind of work cannot be done when there is something blocking my heart. I don't know what it might be for you. I don't know what it is. I, I'm not the person in the school of forgiveness that says, just forgive everybody, just do it. But I am someone who wonders where anyone is on the process of forgiveness. Where is it on the journey toward forgiveness? There's an often misquoted, um, uh, well, it's often misused quote from Sartre, the philosopher that says, hell is other people. He's explained it, uh, and he said it, it's not simply the other, it's not simply other people. What he means is that whenever we really think of an embodiment of evil or what is wrong or corroding in a society, it's really a twisted perspective that another person has. Hell is wrought here and now in the lives of others. This is part of the terror in a sense of having a faith like Unitarian Universalism that believes in the here and now, in the what we doing in this moment, in this life matters, because we do not truck with the idea that there is some alternate superhuman hell. Hell is possible now. And that's the terrifying part of having an unmediated faith like ours. But the miraculous part is that since hell is right here now for some, so is heaven, so is the divine. Because really heaven is in other people. Ask anybody who has to choose, even in the carceral system, between solitary confinement or spending their time with the other people in the prison. Every single person, except for a very few, will choose to be with other people. Perhaps at the biggest, deepest, most profound core of each one of us is the need to be with others, other humans, other people. In the last year and a half, as you can tell from the reading, it specifically tells us the inability to fully and freely move with others is a disease itself. So we've got a disease on top of a disease, and we know that. And it's a sickness that is hurting the human heart in so many ways. 
but things are moving toward getting better. This idea of letting go of, of not holding to this problem the way that Thurman showed us. He moved through his life, moving from problem into solution, from problem into solution. It's a process, not a simple one-time decision. He confesses, he repented, he thinks repent means to change one's mind, and then forgave. And then the final part in this middle part of ho'ono, ho'ono, ho'opono, pono, sorry, is then to release. And to me, when I think of release in these times, the closest thing that comes is a hug these days. That feeling of someone just hanging on to you for dear life. It is the embodiment of so many people of this faith who are here hanging on to Unitarian Universalism for dear life. For some, it's the first house on the block. For some, it's the last house on the block. But for a lot of people, it's the only house on the block. And in this state, on this island, it is literally the only house on the island that holds this faith. Each and every one of the houses where you are holds that faith as well. But together we build this structure of feeling, this structure of love, like a lung that breathes into the world, like a heart that pumps the nutrients that we all need to be together in these times to give us the strength we need to grow and to love. We need all of the lovers in this time. We need all of the ways of understanding, all of the ways of feeling. We need all the ways of learning, perhaps through our own minds through our own experiences getting out of the books and into the earth we need all of the people willing and wanting to see the world change and when we need it like Thurman we need it to be grounded in love if you want to change the world love will guide us if you want to change the chairs in the sanctuary just do it no I'm just kidding but love will guide us if there is anything you want to change in the world, in your life, even in your broken heart, love will guide us to do it. And the key word in that phrase, us. We do it together. No matter how much we think we're doing it alone, we're always doing it together. <laughs>